Well, today we're looking at the story of heaven, and we're looking at the very last chapter of the entire Bible, Revelation 22. And when you think of heaven, or at least when I think of heaven, I I think of the word anticipation. You know, we've all had those times in our life where we have had that sense of anticipation, whether it's a birthday or an anniversary or a graduation or Christmas or something like that, where, where we're anticipating getting some sort of gift. And the gift is wrapped up with a bow on it, and and we anticipate what's inside of it. And I remember as a kid always trying to guess what was inside of it. The only time I ever got that right, back in the days when I got those LP albums, there's no way to really disguise what that looks like. The only surprise was which band was represented on that particular album. But but there were other times when there was this unwrapping of the gift, an unwrapping of the bow, and and you look on the, the box once the, the wrapping paper is off and get excited about what the, the picture of the box looks like. And then those mean people have done this, and perhaps you're one of them, that you put something different inside the box rather than what's on the picture of the box. And there's this sense of excitement, this sense of confusion, this sense of mystery, and that's the sense we get when we think of heaven. There's this anticipation of what it's going to be like. We're not going to be disappointed. In fact, I think we're going to be blown away in ways that we can only imagine, but but you think about this anticipation of what heaven's going to look like, what it's going to feel like, what it's going to be like, what we're going to experience there, what we're going to do there, and all those different things that we anticipate. Well, in the book of Revelation, it gives us a sense of what to anticipate. And in chapter 22, the Apostle John gives us some details about what heaven looks like and feels like and some of the surroundings of heaven. So we're going to look at at chapter 22, beginning with verse 1, and and look at just the beginning of verse 1 into the beginning of verse 2. Here's what it says. Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb in the middle of its street. Pause there. That's where the period is. So it goes into verse 2 there. But but think about what John is saying. He's, he's describing heaven. He started in chapter 21. We looked at that last week, if you remember, and the size and the dimensions and the gates and all the, the different beautiful gemstones and then the gates that are made of the singular pearl, all of those things. But now we we get a sense of what's inside the city, and and we see that there's this river, river of the water of life that's clear as crystal. Now, John said there's no longer going to be any sea, but he did not say there'd no longer be any water. In fact, this river flows right through the middle of the city. It's there for everyone to access, everyone to experience, everyone to see. When I think of rivers, I I think of serenity. I I think of calmness. I I love looking at the the rivers flowing through the the landscape. And there's some people, when they think of rivers, they think of fishing. Others, when they think of rivers, they think of boats. Others, when they think of of rivers, they think of of paddle boating and, and wading in the water. And some just want to relax on the shoreline and looking at the river. And all those different things come to mind. And rivers have always been significant throughout history. Not just in the Bible, but literally throughout all of history, rivers are significant. If you think of the rivers just in our country and some of those major rivers that everyone seems to know and recognize, they're very significant. You think about the Mississippi River flowing from the northern part of Minnesota all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. It goes through 10 different states, and and so many cities are bordering that and were built around that river. It was part of the economy, part of the nutrition. It it gave civilization to those areas because of the river. Think about the Colorado River that that is so mighty and beautiful, and it flows all the way through the Grand Canyon. You think about the Rio Grande River that becomes a border in between two countries. You think about Pittsburgh, who's nicknamed Three Rivers, in fact, One of the stadiums is Three Rivers Stadium because there's three rivers that come through that particular city. So rivers have always been significant, and they will be in in heaven itself that there will be this river of the water of life. And rivers have always represented life in some form or fashion. 
If you think about the book of Genesis, when God created the heavens and the earth, there was water, there was land, there was all these things. But in the Garden of Eden, we're told that there is one river that, that forked out into four rivers. And those four rivers led to different cities and it helped develop civilization. And so it was quite honestly a, a nutrition and a sustenance of life. It represented life there in the Garden of Eden. And you think about the Jordan River. God used the Jordan River in a very significant way. It was the final obstacle that had to be overcome to enter into the promised land for God's people. It was the Jordan River that Jesus was baptized in. It was the Jordan River that John the Baptist had his ministry at. And so rivers have always been significant throughout history in biblical times and in modern day times. And in heaven, there will be this river that is significant. And it will be a constant reminder that it is a source of life, rivers of the water of life. And there is no impurity whatsoever. It says it's clear as crystal. Now, living in Houston, Texas, and we think of rivers, and typically the rivers are not clear as crystal. I grew up in Fort Worth, Texas, and the Brazos River that went through there was definitely not clear as crystal. But in heaven, there will be no impurity. There'll be no algae. There'll be no moss. There'll be no trash. There'll be no dirt. It will be clear as crystal, unlike anything that we've experienced here on this earth. And notice where it comes from. It comes from the throne of God and of the Lamb. So, so you have this river that, that comes from the source of all creation, that which originally said, let there be light and there was light, that which destroyed the old heaven and the old earth that we looked at last week, that which created the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem. He who sits on the throne is the source of this river, and it is a river of the water of life. It gives breath, it gives sustenance, it gives nutrition, it provides the civilization, and it is at the hub of the city in the middle of its street is exactly where everyone has access to. It isn't just for some, but it is for all. It is not to be ignored or denied. It is to be enjoyed. It is the water of life. And Jesus would often talk about rivers and waters pertaining to life. It was in John chapter 7 at the end of, of one of the festivals where he says, he who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. It was to a woman at a well in Samaria that he said these words that whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst, but the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. And so this river in heaven will be a constant reminder of that which is swelling up within us even now for those of us who believe. That which symbolizes eternal life will be reminded day in and day out for all eternity about the life that has no end. But also on this river, there's something else that's significant. It's not just a river, but there's also a tree. Look at the, the last part of uh, verse 2. It says, on either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So, so you have this enormous tree. We're not given the dimensions of it or the, the kind of tree that it was. It's unique in that it has 12 different kinds of fruit, one for every month. So, so it is not a seasonal tree. It's a perpetual tree. It has no end. Every single month, there is this new and fresh fruit that, again, provides nutrition. And it's so large that it is on either side of the river. Now, in my mind, when I read that, knowing that even in the original language, it's the singular tree, not two trees, but a singular tree, that, that the river has to flow through the middle of it. Now, we are familiar with some large trees. When I think of the large trees, I think of the sequoia tree. And in fact, the largest tree on the planet right now is titled General Sherman. And you know where it's located? In a place called Three Rivers, California. I can't make that up. And you think about the size of this tree, 275 feet tall. The trunk is 100 feet wide. It has a volume weight of 2.7 million pounds. It is said to be the largest by volume of living organism on the planet Earth. And it's a tree. 
However, compared to the tree in heaven, it looks like a twig. There is this size and this beauty and the extraordinary atmosphere that God has created in the new Jerusalem. It has a water river, water of life that is clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God himself. It has a tree that's on either side, a singular tree, reminiscent of that which God created in the garden. So he created in the Garden of Eden, obviously there was a river that, that forked off into four rivers, but he also created a tree of life. You know, so there's a tree of good, of knowledge of good and evil. But the tree of life was there at the beginning. But remember, all the things of this earth have passed away. Everything has been destroyed and everything has become new. Remember in Revelation chapter 21 when God said, I have made all things new, not some things but all things new. This is a brand new river. This is a brand new tree, that which never existed before on the face of this earth. This is brand new. And the enormity is extraordinary to have it that size. So we're not given a lot of details of the looks of it or the dimensions of it, but we can only imagine the size of it. And we're also told something about the leaves, not the shape of the leaves or the size of the leaves, but the leaves are for healing, the healing of the nations. Now, originally, when you think about that, say, so, well, wait a minute. In, in heaven, there's not supposed to be any sickness, any dying, or any mourning, or any crying, any of those things. But why would you need healing when you're in heaven? Well, if you look at the commentaries on this particular verse, there are a lot of different interpretations. But for me, it goes back to the meaning of that word. In the Greek language, the word that is translated as healing is therapeua, and it literally is where we get our word therapeutic. And so quite literally, it means service rendered by one to another. So, so in a medical way, therapy is to, to help you strengthen and to grow and to nourish that which you have. And so it's almost like these leaves are going to, to heal and to grow and to nourish. One commentator, I love the way he phrases this, is like a supernatural vitamin. That, that you put it in the Vitamix like never before, and you're going to have uh, the, that kind of power, that kind of nutrition. But it is for that, that to continue growth. I love that the tree of life in heaven is a reminder of God's grace, of God's mercy, and God's provision for all eternity, that which has no end. The, the two constants that we have here with this river and with this tree is life. That's their one commonality. They both represent life, life that has no end. For, for us, we, we fool ourselves thinking that here on this earth, we're, we're living, and we are. We're living, we're breathing, we're experiencing life. We accomplish things, we set goals, we are fruitful and multiply. We invent things, we utilize things, we, we grow trees and we harvest fruit and things such as that. So we are living However, we happen to be existing in the land of the dying. Heaven is the land of the living. If you think about this, and forgive me because it is a little bit crude, but when you're born and you take your first breath, that first breath leads to your last breath. But whatever that time frame is, and it's different for every single person, but whatever that time frame is, that first breath will always ultimately lead to that last breath. However, when you take that last breath here on this earth and you exhale in heaven, that first breath in heaven has no end. It is eternal breathing, eternal life, eternal living. And that's the picture that is painted here. The, the river that flows is one of life. The tree that is planted is one of life. God wants there to be a constant reminder that you are in the land of the living, that you are to experience life eternal, that which has no end. And he's done that in, in a very visual way through the river and the tree. And then he goes on to tell us a little bit about what that life looks like. He gives us a little bit of detail, not all the details, but he gives us enough to capture our attention. If you look at verse 3, uh, it says, There will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his bondservants will serve him. They will see his face. His name will be on their foreheads. There will no longer be any night, and they will not have 
need of light of a lamp nor the light of the sun because the Lord God will illumine them and they will reign forever and ever. Okay, pause there and think about that picture. Think about that description of heaven, of our home that God has prepared for us. He says that there will no longer be any curse. Now, on this earth that we have right now in this life that we're living, in the land of the dying, there's curse. In fact, in Genesis 3, the curses began because when sin entered the world, there were going to be curses. For women, and you know this well if you've had a child, the pain of childbirth is a curse. And that was put forth in Genesis chapter 3. If you've ever worked in a garden or in a yard and you've toiled with weeds and thorns and thistles, that's a curse that was started in Genesis 3. That there were curses that, that happened because of sin that entered into this world. There were consequences for the decisions that, that were made beginning with Adam and Eve and then throughout the generations ever since. But in heaven, there will be no longer be any curses whatsoever. There will be blessings. There will be promises. There will be fulfillment of prophecies, but there will be no curse. And I love that, that there is this blessing that's almost like a threefold blessing. If you think about the way that is described, the first thing is that, that we get to be servants, and, and that, that is an honor. You think about Jesus, and, and he came not to be served, but to serve. And so this is a position of honor, a position of worth, a position of value, that we get to, to serve the one who created all things. But then beyond that, we get to, to see God face to face. That there's this dwelling of God that has never been experienced before. And we get to see God and interacting with God and to, to have uh, this intimate relationship and friendship with God like never before. And we get to be associated with him. It says like we'll have the name on our forehead. And oftentimes when we think about that, we think about the mark of the beast, which is another thing prior to all of this and in, in Revelation. But, but here is this, is this connection, this identification with God that we are part of the family. We're part of the redeemed. We are the citizens of heaven. And then we, we're told that there is no need for the sun. There's no need for light because God himself will illuminate all of heaven. And I love that, that the, the picture here is that there will no longer be any nighttime. And for those of you who suffer for in, from insomnia, this is heaven for you. That you don't even have to worry about or think about sleep. There will be no longer be any nighttime. But the illumination of God is going to be extraordinary. That Shekinah glory is going to, to be surrounding and all-encompassing. That the sun which was created has passed away. There'll be no longer any need for moon or stars or anything like that. We have God himself, the embodiment of light there in heaven. And notice that he says it will reign forever and ever, that there is no end. It goes on in verse 6. And he said to me, These words are faithful and true, and the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show his bondservants the things which must soon take place. So, so there is this, this vision that takes place that, that John has recorded throughout the book of Revelation. But then in verse 7, we have the words of Jesus. If you have a red-letter edition of the Bible, it's in red because it is the words of Jesus says, and behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. If you read that verse, if you've listened to this Bible study or those previously, you're putting into practice these words. You're blessed because you're heeding the words of this book and of this prophecy. You're studying this book and this prophecy. You're embracing the truths of this book. And John was faithful and obedient to write down that which was unveiled to him in the book of Revelation. goes on to say, and John's kind of clarifying this in verse 8, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. So, so he, he is testifying as a witness. I solemnly swear that this is me. I saw and I heard these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Now follow along here. So, so the angel has been his host, if you will, his guide to the unveiling of heaven. 
and he fell down at the feet of the angel and in bowing in this form of worship. But then look at verse 9. But he, the angel, said to me, do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who heed the words of this book. Then notice the next two words. It's a full sentence, worship God. John got so caught up with the host, with the angel, who who was showing him all these things, that that he was overwhelmed to the point that that he bowed down. And the angel said, no, 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 don't do that. I'm one of you. I'm a servant as well. He said, don't forget, worship God. Let your attention always be towards God. And what a great reminder in a year that has been full of distractions, in a year that has been unprecedented in so many different ways. What a great reminder that when it comes down to the Bible, in the last chapter of the Bible, the overwhelming nature of what Revelation oftentimes represents, it comes down to this, two words, worship God. And what a truth that is. And what an opportunity for us to prepare ourselves for heaven by doing that here on this earth. For some, worship is is singing songs of praise. Back in the day, I used to play the guitar and able to sing. I don't do that much anymore. But there's those that that love to sing praises. There are those that that love to to pray, and they can pray for hours. There's those that that will read the the Holy Bible for for hours. There will be those that, that will go to church, and all of these things are part of worship. And you don't have to worship like someone. I cannot sing like some other people. I cannot pray for hours at a time like other people. But I can pray in the car. I can pray at night. I can pray in the morning. I can read a devotional on my my phone app. I can go to to worship services in a, a local church every weekend. And nowadays, even online, if you're not comfortable going in person, there are ways for us to worship God. Don't forget those two words. Above all else, worship God. You think about any time of the year. Think about any season, and it's represented in this chapter. Just with the tree of life, you have 12 months in the year. You have 12 different kinds of fruit. It yields fruit every month. It's a reminder. It's all year long. You think about worshiping God, it's not just one season. Oftentimes, we think of the Christmas season as a time to to kind of focus on God. We think about the Easter season, a time to focus on God. And there are songs related to both of those uh, celebrations that that bring our attention to worshiping God. But we are to worship God all the days of the year, all the years of our life in preparation for heaven. When you think about the story of heaven— Absolutely think about the beauty of the river, the waters of life coming from the throne of God. Absolutely think about the tree of life and in the harvest of that every single month with fresh fruit. Think about the the leaves that, that heal and comfort. Think about the grace and the mercy and the provision of God even in eternity. But don't miss out. Above all else, we have an opportunity to worship God. The one who in the beginning said, let there be light. The one who in the end in heaven is the light. Let us come and worship him today and all the days ahead. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your truth. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your eternal provision through the river, through the tree, and through the life that has no end. Let us be faithful and true to you to worship you above all else today and all the days of our life. In Jesus' name, amen.